I really am thankful for the comment that we received a little bit earlier. For those of you who are unaware, uh, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council believes in using strategies and turning them into action. In short, we don't want to talk about it, we want to be about it. And so we're looking for commitments from everyone in this room as well as those of our panelists so that we can come together in order to promote these strategies. So if you could, from your seat, if you if you are willing or if you are responding positively to the comment that I'm getting ready to make, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you are willing to work together in order to promote programs, policies, and practices that improve outcomes for women and girls who are system involved or at risk of being system involved, please raise your hand. Raise it high. Raise it high. Raise it high. Okay, you can put your hands down. Thank you for that. I think sometimes it's important for us to see that there are other people who are willing to do the work. Because we can talk all we want, but if we talk and don't do the work, we're going to continue to get the same outcomes that we've gotten so far. So we will, we have all of your names as you came in, and now that we know that you are dedicated and that you're empowered based on the discussion we're having tonight, we will be reaching out to you and trying to connect to other programs so we can continue to get your feedback and move this dialogue forward. So thank you very much for that. Now to our panelists, if you would please tell us who you are, tell us the agency you represent, and tell us a little bit about what your agency does for those who are viewing us from home. Hi, I'm Nancy Ware. I'm the Director of Court Services and Offender Supervision for the District of Columbia. And we're responsible for the supervision of men and women who are on probation, parole, or supervised release in the community. Hi, my name is Linda Harley Harper. I'm the Senior Deputy Director at the Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services. And we're responsible for the care and custody and providing service delivery to the young people who are in the deepest end of the juvenile justice system. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Terry Odom, and I'm the director of the uh, Superior Courts, Court Social Services Division, which essentially is the pretrial and post disposition probation um, agency for the District of Columbia where juveniles are concerned. And that includes adolescents um, who are under court supervision for delinquent act, or in adult world, it would be called a crime, as well as status offenders, which would be truants um, and persons in need of supervision. Good evening, my name is Wendy Polhouse. I'm the Executive Assistant for External Affairs with the United States Attorney's Office. And as you may know, the United States Attorney's Office is principally responsible for prosecuting adults here in Washington, D.C. for criminal offenses. However, I am the Director of the Criminal, excuse me, of the Community Outreach Section. So part of what we do is also prevention. And a part of our prevention programs, we have a relatively large portfolio of, of youth intervention programming, and so I will probably be talking about that as it pertains to girls. Thank you. The goal of this panel for us is for us to talk about the strategies that are currently being implemented and also to brainstorm what should we be doing, what could we be doing next. So for our panelists as well as for our audience members, please know that anything you say can and will be used against you in future CJCC meetings. We do plan on holding folks accountable. We do plan on following up. And so we hope that we have a really engaged and uh, robust discussion about how we can continue to turn around outcomes for women and girls. So that being said, first question. Talk to us about any noteworthy trends that you all have seen in your populations. We know nationally that women and girls are being incarcerated more frequently. But in DC, what does that mean? What are you seeing? Are we following this trend? Are you seeing something different? So at Sasosa, we have about 2,200 women, young women um, under our supervision. And over the years, we've seen definitely an increase in the numbers of women who've come, in, come out of prison or who are on uh, community supervision and under our jurisdiction. So for us, it's been an interesting challenge because we've had to readjust uh, our interventions, our supervision strategies, and our services so that they can be more specific to the needs of women. Um, we're also seeing that um, there's an increase in the behavioral health needs of the women who are under our jurisdiction. More and more of them are uh, self-reporting um, histories of mental health disorders, in need of medication, in need of a lot of support and therapeutic interventions. And so that's also required us to take a closer look at the types of interventions that we're providing. Um, we're finding that um, 
Women uh, have often been in the juvenile system and have graduated, unfortunately, into the adult system. Mm -hmm. So we have, in, in response to John's and Mr. Whitehouse, who I don't, I don't know if he's still here, uh, to their comments, we've found that it's important for us as a result to work very closely with the juvenile system. And we've forged a great relationship with DYRS. Court Social Services and uh, Child and Family Services are also coming on board to help us to make sure that we have a good seamless transition from the juvenile systems into the adult system because uh, as you all know and has been mentioned, um, many girls, unfortunately, the gateway for their entry into the adult system is uh, as a result of truancy issues, of not attending schools, of dropping out. And then um, in some cases for young girls who've been um, committed to uh, the abuse and neglect system and they just don't have the supports that they require. Unfortunately, some of them wind up in the juvenile justice system. And over time, you heard all the, the, um, the various challenges that those systems have in terms of stabilizing them. And then unfortunately, they end up in our system. So we find that it's really important to forge a relationship with these other systems because in many cases we have the mothers of women, young girls and even young men who are in the juvenile system. Thank you. Please. So, so what I, um, before, I, before I begin, I do want to um, acknowledge a couple of people. So we have representatives from Family Court Operations, um, uh, Ms. Thomasine uh, Marshall and Ms. Erica Santiago and then uh, Sheila Robeson Adams, Aisha, um, Ramirez and um, Michael Carter and and these are many of the folks who do a lot of the work that is involved with the programming um, with respect to um, the trends I think it's important to put some things in context um, see we really don't know whether the data is a true indicator that girls have begun to commit more crimes because what we do know is historically the criminal justice, the juvenile justice, the mental health and the substance abuse system were not built with women in mind. They were built, and I'm not saying they were built perfectly to meet the men, needs of men, but at the turn of the, the 20th century as women begin to, and girls begin to come into these systems, the initial response was like girls were on the child welfare track, right? And then they, you know, and so you could get into certain special ed programs, um, with women, it was to look at how social welfare programs could respond to them. Um, so we were, we were looking at shelters and, and making sure we had um, uh, aid to families with dependent children and, and all of the benefits. Um, and uh, the same thing was true where, where substance abuse. So even if you talk to law enforcement officers and many of them who are in their post-retirement career, they will tell you that unofficially you didn't respond to adolescent girls the same way you did boys. Uh, it was often a verbal warning. Right, it was a stern talking to, you know, it was taking them somewhere and kind of holding them for a day. And that, that's important to, to put in a framework because so in addition to not responding or not knowing how to respond and then taking uh, programs and painting them pink, we kind of were stuck um, or, or, or other pastel colors, lavender, you know, and yellow. And so that was the, the girl, adolescent, female iteration. Uh, what we do know in looking in the last couple of decades is that the types of crimes that adolescent girls are being arrested for statistically are becoming a bit more violent, right? So when I took this job in 2005, we had a proliferation of girl crew activity and, and some of the names, I'm, I'm talking adolescent girls um, were, were, were unique names, you know, um, bitches with attitudes, uh, you know, most wanted honeys. Um, what was interesting about what we saw, because we did focus groups, we looked at traditional and non-traditional theory around adolescent development. And there are a couple of trends and things that we saw and that the data and the focus groups reveal to us. So, so one thing was that these adolescent girls were quite bright in that when they were in areas where they were outnumbered, they would collaborate. And so we had crews coming together, right? Chopper City and, and others, right? And, and at one point, it was a sort of paramilitary spin to it. They would be walking around with boots and you know, military gear and stuff. So they identified that this core group provided a support that they weren't getting in their families. And that's very important because historically in America, particularly in urban America, and indeed in, in many communities of color, adolescent girls have been tolerated and not celebrated. Right, so there's a competition in the family dynamic between the mom, um, the in many instances a a, a stable male. The, the the father is not in the home. So what what girls are seeing, and this is what they tell us, is they see their mothers bonding with their brothers, 
their families respond to young boys when they get in trouble the way that many families respond when you, you, know, you make an academic or a athletic accomplishment is, oh, you know, um, John got, got arrested. You know, we got to get here. We got to get the canteen. We got to do this, that, and the other. So as a society and a neighborhood, it's conceivable we've taught adolescent girls that they must compete with their male peers. Right, and that by getting in trouble, that is how a family dynamic stops in response to them. And what we see among our adolescent girls is that they apparently, consciously or unconsciously, appear to be up in the ante with crimes. The last thing I'll say in these, in these trends that we're seeing is, um, and, and Ms. Robinson Adams can speak to this, uh, within the past two months, we had a day, first time in the history, one well, of the two last things I'll say on this topic, that the, all the part one offenses were adolescent girls. There were no boys on part one offenses. There was armed robbery, robbery force and violence, right? Co-respondents, that's significant. Because when I took this job in 2010, girls represented 10% of our population. Today they are 30% of our population with an ad average population daily that vacillates between 1,400 and 1,500. So the implications are really far reaching for what we need to be doing with our girls to stem the tide of them going on into these adult systems. As a community, what can be done to, to help these girls from becoming system involved? And I want to direct this one to Ms. Polhaus. Okay. So one of the first things I want to talk about, um, as a, I work in the community all the time, and I attend a tons of community meetings. And one of the things that's kind of troubling to me is that the community, we're angry at our children, right? And that's a problem to me. We're angry with our children. And we're angry with our girls, and we pass judgment on our girls. And one of the things that we're doing as a community, and I'm guilty myself, you know, like you say, well, it wasn't like that when I was, when I was growing up. You know, it was different, right? But one of the things we have to look at is that it's a different experience for girls now, right? And I'm even going as far as saying the experience of being a girl is far more tra traumatic than we ever knew, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things we learned from the ACE study, and also we learned, um, there's another report by the Department of Justice um, called Defending Childhood, and it was, in, it was put out in 2012. And it talked about the level of trauma that children experience. Physical trauma, sexual trauma, trauma from violence in your communities, all these traumas, and one out of 10 children here in America are what they call poly victims, right? That means that one out of 10 children in this country are experiencing more than one of these sources of violence in their lives, right? So what does that mean for us? That means our kids, and especially our girls, because we also know that our girls are more susceptible to sexual abuse, right? So that means our kids and our girls are walking around with post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? So we need to acknowledge that as a community, right? And also, I'm always hard on communities when it comes to our children, right? So one of the things I'm going to just put out there, I heard, I heard um, one of our community partners, his name is Imam Sharif from uh, Majid Muhammad, and he said, when there is something wrong with the child, there is something wrong with the village, right? And so we need to, that's the first, so when we have this conversation, we first must say, it is something wrong with the village, right? And so, you know, when I'm thinking about, like, how to work with girls, I've been very blessed to be involved, because, you know, as a prosecutor, I've been, I'm more focused on girls before they even get to my co-partners here. Like, I, I'm, that's what my, my thing is. And even both as a prosecutor and also just because I'm a former citizen of Ward 8, I also am dedicated to girls, and I know that there are pockets of girls in Ward 7 and 8 who are right on the cusp, right? It's too many, right? So that, so, you know, we've, we had talks, I think we have to have a conversation about girls in every, in every line of this, of this, uh, uh, problem, right? We have the girls who are already involved, and then we have the girls that are right here, right? And so those, and I do want to mention, like, I do think that mentoring is the key for these girls, right? And so when we talk about what those look like, now sometimes I think we make a big deal about something that's nothing that we all could do, right? So one of the things that, you know, when we're talking about girls and community responses, I think it's very easy for us to begin as a community to create safe places for girls where they can begin to communicate to us what's going on, right? And those safe places are very easy to do, right? And, and first I want to talk about the community who's responsible for doing that. Okay, so we have the president who has his initiative for boyhood. That's great, right? And, and when you look at that, at that website, you see that there's largely men who are doing that work, right? So you know what? We are responsible for doing that work, women, in this room. And, all, and we're on TV. I'm also going to put a shout out to sororities, women ministries, um, all these other groups. And maybe that might be the next conversation we have, pulling those, tapping into those women organizations, get them all here so they can hear this, so they can begin to be thinking about how they can get in. And also I want to mention to people, I think we get overwrought with like this notion of funding, right? 
that's also not something that we, as a community, we, we have to necessarily all, always be so concerned about. So what, you know, I've done a lot of research, and also I'm blessed to have a mentoring group in Ward um, 7 right around the corner at Cap Capitol View Library, and I'm very involved in scouting in Wards 8 and 7. So what do those safe places look like for girls? Okay, so I, you know, when I look at best practice, I just want to put this out to those people who are thinking about mentoring. Okay, so you have, to, you have to have a person who's a trusted adult, right? And I often tell that to people, right? And I just, not just organizations, I always, always ask people in the community, are you a trusted adult, and I'm asking women, are you a trusted adult to a girl who's not a, your family member? Right? Is there some girl in the community who can come to you and talk to you about what potentially be going in, on in her life? We all are potentially, almost every woman in this room is capable of being that trusted adult, right? And also like when you, when you work with girls, especially in wards seven and eight, um, we have to do more listening. I think I heard somebody say that before, more listening and less talking, right? And you have to be consistent, right? And then you have to find a mechanism in which you'll, you can get girls to talk. Now, I, you know, one thing I do with my mentoring group is a, it's a book club, and we call ourselves the Young Reading Divas. And I choose books, and we choose books that will prompt the conversation, like we choose books where the parents are struggling with drug abuse. We, we talk about like a, a parent who perhaps is um, suffering under mental health, or a girl who's suffering under um, some type of stress. And you'll be surprised the things that are said once you have set that trusted, safe place for girls, which you'll come with. And just in case like you're doubting, for instance, that you can um, get some of this, you can get to some of the, uh, the causes and girls won't tell you, they will when you, when you give them these spots. Because I had a one girl, and we came in for January. And I, you know, I asked everybody, say, what is your, um, your New Year's resolution? And she said, to get into more fights, <laughs> right? Now that's, and when I say, and that's, and that's a classic example, if, you, if you're, you're mistaken that m basic mentoring and simple relationships with girls who are at risk can change it. So she said, I'm gonna get into more fights this year. And I said, why? You know, and I, and I wanted, my tendency is all adults, like, are you crazy, whatever? But you have to listen. And then she began to tell why she thought that was an appropriate goal for uh, 2015, right? But, but surprisingly, the girls self-corrected in the meeting, right? And so this is, not, this is not a lot, and it doesn't cost a lot of money, right? And so I think as a community, we need to be getting and thinking about in terms of what we can do. And while I think government partnerships and some of this work is government, I think some of this work is pure community, right? It's pure community, and it doesn't cost a lot. You know, most girls will come out if you give them some um, chips, cookies, and some um, Capri juice boxes, right? And you have a, a trusted adult who's in there that, that can find it's simple, interesting activities, right? Like, for instance, when I talk about book clubs, maybe the book clubs who are listening to me, especially those of minority groups, you can host a young sister book club, and you can choose books that will allow your girls to talk about the things that are going on in your life. So I'm really focused on like girls in wards seven and eight, and really be trying to like encourage people to create like safe places for them, because you know we assume that these girls have places to go, and they don't. And also, um, when you're looking at girls in um, wards seven and eight, I'm always astounded of the level of responsibilities that they have that are beyond that what children should have. Because even when, we, when I've worked with girls both in scouting in wards seven and eight, and uh, even in my own group, I'm surprised at the extra siblings that come, right? So it forces me even to bring, like have to have a separate activity, a mini meeting for the, the siblings. And so we need to begin to relieve our girls of some of that. And again, that's, that's us, that's the women, right? That's the women organizations in the city. And like when I, you know, and I belong to a Greek letter organization, but there's like, uh, when we think about this, probably like maybe good 15 Greek letter women organizations in this city, right? We have a Women's Bar Association. We have a National Women's Bar Association. We have many black women organizations, Hispanic women organizations, and maybe that might be our, one of our next steps to really create a, a clearinghouse of, and bringing those women in and saying, let's, let's do it. Let's see how we can provide, let's start our own girl, national girl, girl initiative, because I do think we could do a much better do job and celebrating our girls, teaching them what self-esteem looks like, because also when you think about some of the, the precursors of um, what can cause it is like, when you think about domestic violence, which is a precursor to girls getting in, entering into the criminal justice system, a lot of that is tied into self-esteem. That's, that's tied into ce celebrating who you are and having some other woman who looks like you help you celebrate who you are. We think that our girls are getting that, our girls are not getting that, right? And so we, and so that's some that's some of the grassroots work that can happen in communities, and I'd like us to all be involved in. And I think, and I think we can do it. I really think that we have enough talent. So in the community, that's where I'm at, and you know, and I will work with people. And I, and I also think that perhaps um, what might be helpful, I would probably like to see some level of clearinghouse or um, some repository of what is available for girls now. Like, for instance, if there are mentoring groups in the city, I, it would be great to have that kind of repository so that way um, it can be accessed and so girls can get to it. We do have those kind of things for boys. I see it all the time when I get emails, and I, I really see those, that type of thing for girls. 
So I love that we're talking about strategies already. You're moving us into phase two of this conversation. Thank you very much for the appropriate introduction. I wanted to give DY, our partners at DYRS an opportunity to chime in about the trends and we'll talk about strategies. Sure, thank you. So um, at DYRS we're noticing that um, for the young ladies who come to DYRS, they're in the deepest end of the system, and many times they face failed systems way before they get to us. So a lot of times they have a lot of very basic needs that have gone unmet for a long time. We currently have 58 young ladies who are committed to DYRS, and we are right now really taking a step back to really take a look at the services that we provide to young ladies and really make an inventory and decide if what we're doing is what we need to keep on doing and how we need to change and what we need to add. I think that we all can acknowledge and recognize that the city as a whole has to do more for the young ladies, particularly in the juvenile justice system. We failed them for a very long time and we all kind of know it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, providing them with residential care or providing them with treatment services, a lot of time the city doesn't have right here in DC what we need in order to meet the needs for our young ladies. And so a lot of time our young ladies are faced with being placed out of state because we don't have the services that we need right here in DC. And so <clears throat> DYRS is really looking at what we need to do in order to keep our young ladies close to home and how we can engage the community and the families more so that we can make sure that we keep our young ladies right here in DC rather than sending them out of state. That being said, um, I, I appreciate what Ms. Polhouse said because we have to listen to our young ladies and hear from them about what are the services that they need. And we have a lot of DYRS staff here right now who are here because this is something that um, Director Lacey is really pushing us to take a look at how we can do a better job of meeting the needs of our young ladies and making sure that while we're, our numbers certainly are much larger for young males that we have at DYRS that we certainly need to look at how we can take these 58 young ladies, which is a relatively small number, but it is growing. And the, um, the, the trends that we're seeing is a lot of increased uh, sex, sexual trafficking uh, yeah. charges and a lot more young ladies who don't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, a tough combination because when you don't have anywhere to go and you are out in the street, what you're going to do in order to survive becomes much more desperate. So one of the things that DYRS is doing is uh, we have a, a Covenant of Peace initiative that we're launching where we are, um, I'm going to let Mr. Jenkins, who is the special assistant to the director, to speak about it in more detail. But it's an opportunity for the community to engage with our young people and, and to hear from them, but also to provide information to them as well in an interactive conversation. And Mr. Jenkins, do you, you need a microphone back there? Can we get him a microphone? Thank you. So you can talk about the covenant of peace and share about how we're going to hear from our young ladies. Good evening. Thank you, everybody. I am Raheem Jenkins, and I presently serve as the administrative officer for DYRS. And uh, basically, out of a conversation with Director Lacey, we had an opportunity to discuss one day when he first got to DC to be the director. And Director Lacey shared that his basic premise to me was that he had once heard a speech by Dr. Martin Luther King. And in that speech, uh, Dr. King referenced what love looked like in, in the public, in public policy. And so he took that and began, he said he wanted to take a look at when he got to D.C. to see what love looked like in DYRS. And, I, and that was compelling to me when he said he wanted to see what love looked like in DYRS, meaning that he wanted us to treat the children in the care and custody of DYRS like we would treat our own. We'd want, he wants those same services. So in that conversation, I shared with him that I had not gotten myself involved in the theme of Black Lives Matter, because we began to talk about the escalating violence here in the district. And so I said I had not been in that conversation about Black Lives Matter. And then I think the next thing that came out, it was that all lives matter. And so I shared with him that I thought the premise that we should embark upon is that for each individual child, we should have ours in our care and custody saying, my life matters. And so out of that, we talked about beginning to develop a covenant of peace to begin to uh, curtail some of this escalating violence that we're seeing in both the males and the females here in the city. And see, a covenant is different than a treaty, because a treaty is a, an agreement among men. But a covenant is based upon that agreement with that 
that, that spiritual place that you go, that center, that God of your understanding. And so out of, that, out of that, we decided that there would be four basic premises to it. The first one would be my life matters. The second would be the act of forgiveness. And that's, that's so critical here in the city because our young people don't know how to forget. When I came up in this city, if you had a beef, you sat down, you were honorable, you shook hands, you agreed that the beef was over. They do what they call now playing the 50. They'll say they agree, and then the first time they catch you slipping, as they say it in their lingo, then they get at their man. So you have to understand that whole process of the act of forgiveness, and that covers a lot of things, and that's a very, very critical step. To and it's powerful that when you can actually look at somebody, you can actually look at a father who has not been a good father, or a mother who has failed you, or somebody that has sexually abused you to say that within your heart, I forgive you. So that's freedom for you once you get that place. So that's what we want to empower them with. The third one is that my word is my bond, is that you have to know the significance of what comes out of your mouth. And then lastly, my family is, is my all. Now those are the four premises for the young men in DYS. The first two are the same for the young ladies. The second two, and some of the sisters that are here that are involved with the DYS, this covenant of peace can remind me of the, the, the third and fourth one of theirs. And I think the third one is the impact of absence, and the last one is the power of the tongue. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that apply to the females. So quickly what we're gonna do is that in the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving, at the New Beginnings facility in, uh, in Laurel, we intend to go in on a Friday evening at six o'clock and have all of the, the juveniles that are there at New Beginnings go into the gym at six in the evening. And we will not come out until Sunday at 12 noon. And over the course of that, we will engage in, in very intensive focus groups based upon those four premises that I just shared with you. My life matters, the act of forgiveness, and, and so on. And we will have midnight basketball, we're gonna have poetry slams, and we're going to develop that covenant, those things that you give your word to, that you buy in and that you speak against senseless acts of violence. And then after we complete that one, we intend to go to YSC and deal with the young ladies there and to do the same thing, but this will be dominated and, and run by females addressing those issues what are distinct and separate to the young ladies in our care and custody. The third one will be for the young boys at YSC the fourth one we will do for all the group homes and shelters that's in the community. We'll find a site in the city and we'll do the same thing there. And lastly, we're gonna do one for uh, city, all of, for each ward around the city, bring some of those representatives and have this same covenant. So I need you to listen out for this covenant of peace, embrace it, support it, and have that be a part of your conversation as well. Lastly, what I'd like to share is this. I'm in a very, blessed position to have been a provider of services for so many years in Washington, D.C. Before coming to DYS, I actually was also responsible for all juveniles charged as adults in the district. So that meant all the juveniles that were at the jail was my responsibility. It is heartbreaking to see the efforts that the Department of Corrections does to try to provide services for the juveniles, but even more so for girls that go there. It is not a place for children to be served. And it makes it even more difficult for the young ladies that are there because it changes the whole movement and programming in any adult facility where you have children. Just for example, at the jail, if you move a juvenile, and particularly a female, through the jail, you have to put the whole jail on lock just to move that individual. There's no housing there for them. So they're housed with adults, but legally they're not supposed to be, so they're separated by what is called sight and sound. Mm -hmm. So when you're separated by sight and sound, that means it limits your interactions with other folk, it limits your programming and all of that. So we've got to get that right. And so it is dehumanizing what we are doing to girls in this city in terms of services. And thank so you, Mr. Jenkins. Get that fixed. I want to get one okay. more question to our right, panel. So I can go. Thank you but very noted much. the covenant of peace the for those of you of in the audience right. and watching at home. Keep your ears ears out and keep your eyes tuned for the covenant of peace.
So I want to pose one question to our panel, and then I want to open it up for a little bit of discussion. So we've had a chance to hear a bit about the landscape, what do we know about these populations, needs, barriers, and challenges. We want to now put these words to work. So for those of you who are seated up at the dais, what are you willing to do? What strategies are you willing to deploy? If, or strategies that you are already deploying in order to address the needs of this particular population? How can we work together in order to improve outcomes for women and girls? And what do you need in order for us to implement these strategies you may already have in mind or are working on currently? So one thing I just, I failed to mention earlier, for those who are actually looking for resources and how to work with these populations, especially girls, the Department of Justice, the, uh, the Department of Juvenile uh, Justice and Delinquency Programs does have a girl initiative, right? And so that girl initiative, what it does, it does keep track of uh, some statistics about what's happening with girls who are both delinquent and who are being arrested. It serves as a clearinghouse for best practices. It also generates reports really that's really, um, um, honing down on why girls are entering the criminal justice system. And more importantly, it has a funding stream that's called the Innovation Award. Last year, the solicitation came out early January, so that those who are looking to do some of this work might be looking out for, for that again this year. So on the national level, that is something that um, that's there. But also, again, um, part of what we do in the community outreach section is community education. And one of the things over the past year, and we plan on continuing, is for, and we have partnered with DRS, Fairview, um, and other, um, uh, other pockets where girls are justice involved and women are justice involved. And really kind of begin to, and we work with our, our own advocates who are often social workers and domestic violence social workers. And really beginning to like hone in that making sure women understand what that looks like. I think we also um, do not, we, we take it for granted for instance, that a, a girl knows what domestic violence looks like, and she may not. She may just think that's her reality, right? And, and, you, and, we, and we just kind of like brush over that a lot. And so a lot of times it's, it's just that education piece, and then you say, oh, that's domestic violence? Or when you tell a woman, you know what, when you hold that guy's gun, and you hold his drugs for him, and you feel compelled to hold his drugs in your apartment, and there's a search warrant done, that's domestic violence, right? And you should look at it in those terms and begin to deal with that. So some of that is education, and we are involved in that education, both also with sexual abuse, to make sure women, especially minority women, sometimes we just don't understand what is happening to us is not normal, right? It really is something that you can address and get treatment from. So part of it is the education and beginning to, to make women understand that even before they become justice involved. So that's kind of um, also, I think it's part of the dynamics of what could happen. So how, I wanna, so, so that is education. That's actually going out and doing education. But also, because I'm still committed to, <laughs> girls before they get into the criminal justice system, I am definitely committed to working with any partners here who want to begin to start the clearinghouse to, to identify those things that are good in the city that are happening for girls, engaging women organizations um, to see if we can get them involved in having something, a similar form like this so they can hear what's really happening to our girls. Because I also think that sometimes this might be a disconnect because sometimes women who are belonging to these organizations are not the ones who are actually present in Ward 7 and 8. And they may, they may not know, but if they do know, they might say, okay, now I, I, I see that they don't know that this is happening, right? And, and so if you kind of educate those pockets of women about what's happening to our girls, I, I don't know how they can turn a blind eye. So I think we at least have to try to engage those women who perhaps are not actually in the trenches um, with the kids here in these wards that are experiencing trouble and kind of expose it to them. And let's see if we can get some commitments from them also. So that's something I'm committed to work on also. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, Director Odom. So, um When we began the, the, the journey to focus on adolescent girls starting back in 2005 and, and we were able to launch the nation's first ever um, adolescent girls pre-trial and post-disposition probation unit, Leaders of Today in Solidarity, which is lots. The interesting thing was we, as a, as a probation um, component, we recognized that girls had been ignored. But the minute we started meeting in focus groups with a specific focus on girls, the prevailing comment was, well, I hope you're gonna do something like that for boys. Yeah. Interestingly enough, there were just as many women who made that statement to me as men. So I think it's important to be clear that when we talk about this population, it's gotta be more than soup. You know, the suit, it's gotta be the substance, right? Because the rhetoric itself is not gonna get us there. Um, when we 
talk about what we're doing in this, in this city around girls, we have to recognize that prevention is fundamental. And, and yes, there should be a, pre a, a prevention czar, maybe even a prevention arm or an agency where it taps into resources from, from education, mental health, substance abuse, um, to get ahead of this. And I, I certainly commend uh, Council Member uh, McDuffie for this very revolutionary progressive legislation that takes a public health approach that, that Dr. David Satchel was talking about back in 2001 and two in his report on youth violence. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be in the moment as that, a, 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 among many, as that is happening. But we've, we've got to get away from this fear that we have in this city as well, particularly where girls are concerned that if you bring them together en masse in numbers, the city will burn. And that is the reality. We talk about the needs of girls, but the minute you talk about doing something in a collaborative way, whether it's in jurisdictions, um, whether it's in each one kind of reach one, because I believe the unique part, and I, I stipulate no child should have to come into a system to get these services, but when they when a young person does, particularly a girl, that gives you access into their peers. That's how we, working with, with, with organizations like Peaceaholics, were able to reduce the crew activity that was happening you know, in the early 2004, 2005, because we had the girls that were involved in court, we were able to connect with their peers, and as an incentive, we were able to dispel a, a great deal of what's going on. So, so um, what, what I'm committed to is continuing in, in this regard um, to really raise awareness, to, to try to challenge and inspire or motivate a focus and dedication of resources. Because you're right, this is not just a government lift and it's not just a private industry lift. It is a public-private partnership. And the contributions are in many ways. It's in real time capital, it's human capital, Right? It's a variety, it's education. We've got a variety of the universities here who we're not tapping into, that we need to help tap into to help us look at data, collect data around our programming to determine what works and what doesn't. Um, lastly, what I will say, and, and this is bigger than, than, than Terry or, or, or any one person, um, what, what I'm delighted is that the court was committed to a focus. You know, when you have a presiding judge of the family court, Lee F. Satterfield, the Honorable Lee F. Satterfield, who goes on to become the chief judge, you have continuity. You have a continued, along with our, our executive officer, Ms. Wicks, and others. So when we ask Congress for two and a half million dollars to build the nation's first ever girls drop-in center, and we receive that money in 2013, and we begin to build in 2014, we have a facility that is exclusively dedicated to girls. We, we have staff who we have trained um, in, in, in a model and philosophy. Um, our vocational tracks focus on things, we'll focus because we're, we're in the process of, 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 we have the facility, we've moved in it, we're in the process of, of now laying out and building among the staff what the programming will look like to launch it. Uh, so web design, fashion design, uh, nutrition, soft skills, peer-to-peer -peer engagement um, are a number of the vocational tracks. And I will say this, because every time we say fashion design, there's an assumption of, okay, Terry, you talked about not painting systems pink, and then you talk about fashion design. Let's be clear, the majority of fashion is, is, is uh, uh, dominated by men, mm -hmm. right? So let's, let's be clear that that, that that is not a role where, black, uh, where, where women, right, not just women of color, have shattered the ceiling. But, but my commitment around fashion design has a lot to do with self-esteem, self-image. How we look says something about how we feel. Let us be very clear. How we look is very important. And for our young people, having access to what we wear is extremely important. And, and if you look at it theoretically, when, when folks don't have access to resources to get what you should have, I'm, I'm coming, what will happen is, is they will create that. So there's a correlation to solicitation, to uh, hang, you know, peering up with people who break the law to, to get things to wear. And so what we're trying to teach our young girls is that from an economic point of view, you may not be able to afford to buy all of what you want, but it's a lot easier to buy one pattern. You can make five to 10 different dresses or outfits off of that, right? And then you can get a job, you can get your shoes and everything else. So that's what we're committed to. So let me ask you this quickly. If you could tell us how can we help? How can the folks who raise their hands, folks who are watching, how can they help? How can they be supportive in your efforts? We would, if you're a government agency, we have shared space. When we built the barge, 
there, there is some space that if your mental health, if your substance abuse, core service agency, collaborative, we're partnering with you, um, community-based providers, some of what we, the court has contracts, we have space where you can come in and you can do your services because many of providers are funded by other agencies and it's hard for you to research, hard for you to connect and identify with kids to come. So we also can commit to um, our work because uh, we have supervision over the kids to get them connected to the services. Uh, Ms. Woodland talked about the family group conferencing and things of that nature, but I think the public-private partnership, if, if I heard someone talking about dance and, and, and some of the other uh, arts and programs, we would welcome the opportunity to partner and expand the, um, the uh, lexicon or, or, or the menu of services that we can offer. Because I don't think we can afford to have any stone unturned, whether it's sports, whether it's spelling, whether it's, it's karaoke. We want to tap into anything that's going to stimulate our young people and be the point where we can say that's the light turning on and we can basically launch and go forward from there. Thank you very much. Please talk to us about your strategies and how the system can support you and communities can support you. Sure, thank you. You know, today, uh, Ms. Dulce, uh, who's the Deputy Director for Youth and Families, when she was here, she referenced that we had a young lady that was in secure care who was nine months pregnant. That was today. Her due date was today, and she was in detention. She's nine months pregnant. And that talks about the lack of resources that we have in the District of Columbia. And so I'm really looking, you know, the the issues that come along with having a young lady in detention who's nine months pregnant, the safety, the security, the health care, the prenatal care, all of that is huge. It, it, everything about the, her diet, everything poses a challenge and an issue. And I think that DYRS is challenged in making sure that we're meeting the needs of the young ladies and paying attention to details. Because that's something that really makes a difference for all of our young people, but for girls it really matters in a big way in terms of, so we were able to have her place today in a place that specializes in um, for a, a place for young mothers, which is really great. And um, But you know, the small things, like whether or not she has a suitcase to have her belongings in, even though she was in detention, and making sure that she has maternity clothes that are the proper size and making sure that we're helping her to prepare to be a mother is a lot of the details that sometimes get forgotten. And I think the city is in a great place right now because the juvenile numbers are low across the board. And I think that we have to acknowledge that. And I know that at DYRS, for us, our numbers are lower and it offers an opportunity for us to figure out how to be more individualized with the services that we provide to the young people. I'm really looking forward to the Covenant of Peace because it's going to offer an opportunity for young ladies to talk to us about what they need. And for us to actually, we have already taken a pause. So DYRS, for those of you all who don't know, the community-based services are provided through DC Youth Link. We have pressed pause on DC Youth Link in a planning kind of way, not in the way that we provide services. The kids are still getting services. There's no lapse in services, but we've pressed a pause on the planning of it so that we could take a step back and figure out if what we're doing is actually working and if it's the way that we should continue to do services and making sure that we're meeting the needs of our young ladies through D DC Youth Link, excuse me, and whether or not we need to increase the services and what types of specific services we need to add to our, you know, uh, you know, pot of services that we have available for young people. And so from the covenant of peace, we're going to hear from our young ladies, we're going to take their suggestions, and we're going to turn them into actual services that meet their needs based on the feedback that they give us. We also have a parent group that meets regularly who also are feeding us information, not just about what they need, but what about their young what their young people need. And so I think the easiest thing uh, and the largest thing that I can say right now about how to help DYRS is to um, offer to volunteer for the Covenant of Peace. Um, as uh, Mr. Jenkins references, it's going to be a, a lot of hours with young people, and so as many people that can help out as possible. There's been an enormous outpouring of community engagement. Um, there are going to be um, uh, celebrities who are participating as a part of it, and I think that having as many community um, members to participate and help the community to engage so that we can also hear from the community, but also so that the young people can hear from the community about how their actions are 
are impacting us because I, the actions of our young people, they impact, they impact me when I go home and I have to look around before I get out of my vehicle in D.C. where I live and where I was born and raised. Their actions impact us and we have to be aware of that, but we have to make them aware as well because teenagers aren't always in tune and cognizant to what's going on. That's what teenagers do. And so I think that um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the covenant piece. I, I think it offers a volunteer opportunity for the community and I think that that's the best way to support us and the efforts that we're doing moving forward. Thank you very much. Director Ware. Well, um, we need so much here, <laughs> and uh, we, go, we help each other. Yeah. So I, first and foremost, I think it's important for you to know that we do work together, we do. and we do help each other, and we try very hard to use all of our resources. The U.S. Attorney's Office comes to Sasosa to help us with our annual Women's Forum every year. We have fashion shows. Wendy Polehouse makes them up. Mm and tells them how special they are, and, and we all collect clothes and those kinds of things. So all of the things that you've heard us do, we have a wonderful program called WIC. I don't know, Marcia, if you're still here, stand up, please. But Marcia has been responsible for a special program called Women in Control again. Um, I'd love for her to have time to tell you about it, but I don't know if we do. But I think for me, as I listen to my colleagues here today, and maybe it's because of what's been happening today. And I can say, talk about this as a federal agency where some of the district agencies may not be able to. We have to hold our city accountable. We have to be citizens who care. We have to stand up for our young people and for people who are returning. Mm -hmm. We can't sit back and be observers anymore it is so important for all of us to be at the city council, holding those council members accountable for the budget. We need treatment. Mm -hmm. We've got more and more young people and adults who are suffering in our communities. They're suffering and they need support. Mm -hmm. They need all kinds of therapies, art therapy, dance therapy, talking therapy, but they need support. And we're not giving it to them. We're doing everything on the back end of the system where we come into contact with them on my end to put them in jail. That's not the answer. So we have to hold our city accountable and hold ourselves accountable to putting in place prevention, to work with, with our, our citizens to make sure that they understand what that means and to put programs in place that prevent young people from moving through this system. What's happening in D.C. is scary because we have a group of young people and older people who are being disenfranchised and who have been disenfranchised. And we are not addressing the core concerns of our communities because politically it's, more, it's easier to come up with sound bites that people feel comfortable about in putting in place punitive measures. We can't, punitive measures will never help. We know what the issues are in the city. We've talked about them, all of us up here have talked about them for years. Prevention, economics, housing, treatment. That's what we need for the folks that we serve. And until we do that, until we get into the educational issues, prevent them from dropping out of schools, create the programs that they need so that they feel enfranchised again because they're in special education, they don't drop out of school because there's no place to go when you're in special education. You just drop out and you get caught up in the, in the street life. That's not what we want for our kids. And, and Rahim said it best when he said, we want for them the same thing that we want for our own families. That's the standard we should be holding our city accountable for. So as all of us as citizens, hopefully of this city, but even if you're not, you have a voice and we need to teach our children and our adults who are in the system and coming out and trying very hard to get on their feet again, teach them to use their voices in a constructive way and in a powerful way mm -hmm. to change the policies of this city. Mm -hmm. That's what we can do together. You can applaud for that, that's okay. The call to action has gone out. 
As I mentioned before, this is not just us sitting up here talking. Each and every one of you now has a charge. So the question is, what are you going to do differently tomorrow that you didn't do today? What more can you do? Can you give more time? Can you invite someone else out to events like this? Can you get people to talk about these issues in a meaningful, comprehensive way that results in action, that results in positive outcomes? So our charge to you all is to do something different, do something more, and get other people to get on board. Before we get out of here, I just want to remind each of you that there's a yellow comment card that should, been, should have been seated, should have been on your seat. If you do not have one, please find one at a seat near you. We are so interested in hearing your comments and feedbacks. If you would like to see more programming like this, if you want to get involved, if you want to get connected to one of the agencies that you've heard from up here or one of the agencies that you've heard from uh, during our comments section, we want to start making those connections so we can move from words into getting into the work. With that, and on behalf of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council and my Executive Director, Manon Butler, we thank you for coming out. We honor you, we appreciate your time and your talents and your energy, and we encourage you to use what you've learned today to do something different. Thank you all very much. <laughs>